On today's episode, we talk about mergers and acquisitions. We talk about the economy a little bit. We talk about how to set up your business if you're looking to have it acquired long term. It's going to be amazing stuff. We're with an expert who does it all the time. Let's get started. You talk about it privately. We talk about it publicly. This is the Real Estate Insiders Unfiltered Podcast. Welcome again to the Real Estate Insiders Unfiltered Podcast. I'm your host, James Dwiggins, along with my co-host, Keith Robinson, a.k.a. Crazy Uncle Keith. What is Keith, up? Yes. Tell us, tell the viewers, tell the listeners who's on the show today and what are we talking about? Today we got Dan Duffy, who came from actually a technology and finance background and parachuted into residential real estate. He's uh, he's, we're going to talk about uh, mergers and acquisitions, what we see in the marketplace, pitfalls to avoid, hopefully. And then uh, we, I'd love to learn a little more about his Louisiana roots. So <laughs> that's what we got going on today. Awesome. Here we go. Dan, welcome to the James. show. We mm -hmm. are excited to uh, have you here. Yes. Uh, I wanted to to let the viewers and listeners know that uh, Dan is somebody I admire. He's a, I call him a personal friend. We've spent many years together at lots of industry functions and um, we're going to talk about a lot of really interesting stuff today, but I wanted to have you at least just introduce yourself, uh, your background. I know you've, I looked up your profile and you were the CEO and president of ePartners. You were the chief financial and development officer at Machine Web what and the? founding member and senior manager at Ernest & Young uh, Center it. for Strategic Transactions. I know, but here's the Let's, thing. Yeah. Let Dan is one of the most interesting people because he <laughs> you is- You mean like that beer commercial? Yeah. He's the guy? Yeah. He's the most the interesting guy. man in the world. He's the most no interesting seconds. guy in the world. His background is so unique for somebody in the position of, of where he's at. So tell us just a little bit about like that, like how you got into the industry from this career in tech and finance. Yeah. And apart, after the how, tell us the why, because I'm curious yeah. about that. Too. Like, what are you doing in real estate? Yeah. 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 yeah good question. I, you know, I ask myself that question yeah. every once in a while. But We all do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I, it's, everything's a journey, right? Yeah. It just kind of links. I, I, not wanting to go back and talk about things as you're a kid, you know, where you lived and everything, but I grew up in a, in a house, uh, with a mom who kind of studied and analyzed comparative religion. So that was on one side okay. and she was very, very into the spirituality of things and the connectiveness of things. Okay. And then, uh, NASA engineer. Wow. <laughs> so, so, so I kind of had this dichotomy going what, on constantly. Uh, uh, he what was launching missiles in like? satellite like, beach. What was yeah. Like? What was that about? <laughs> yeah. It was interesting. On the one hand, my, my mom would ask you how you felt yeah. and how was your day yeah. and all that stuff. And my dad would be like, this is exactly the way you're supposed to put your That's fork. Right. You know, so Feelings it was are uh, just a paradigm. Yeah. 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 yeah it's a construct, yeah. but yeah. Um, no, it was, it was great. You know, the very loving That's environment, awesome. you know, my, my parents were, uh, were married for years and years and I saw, you know, what, what life could be from them. Mm. And I loved it. And the curiosities of things, you know, being able to, to conceptualize uh, building a rocket and trying to get to the moon, you know, with the Saturn program <laughs> yeah. and kind of growing sure. up around that. Yeah. Yeah. I have trouble getting how to build a shoulder filed missile. Yeah, I have trouble you know, getting my mic to work for this podcast. So yeah, knowing no, that too. someone can, can yeah. think that way is really a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah, but my dad, my, you know, from a guidance perspective, you know, we we ended up. I was exposed to entrepreneurship. You know, I saw him eventually move into his own businesses. Uh, you know, auto parts manufacturing in the U.S., Canada, Mexico, et cetera, and and just the the thrill of of having an ownership position in a business and sure. being an entrepreneur. And so I really liked that, but then I, I, I really, I really wanted to get a foundation of things and really understand. I'm extremely curious about how things work. Yeah. Um, randomly curious, <laughs> you know, recently I gave a presentation on the pie phenomenon, which, you know, I'll just leave it at that. I, I could go on for that for like three you hours. Mean, Cause I went really deep on it. 3.14 <laughs> or like, do you mean cherry pie? No. No, I mean pie as in, you know, flashing lights in a circle, but when your brain tries to lace the, the, the pieces in between, you actually see a moving circle. Oh, Keith, uh, it's Keith went down the road of it was like, a real estate presentation yeah. too. Okay, because Keith went down the road of cherry pie for a minute there. And I did. Like, yeah, yeah, apple, yeah. apple's like, my really? favorite, but I, yeah. you know, my favorite pie is the one on my plate. But no, uh, that's yeah. awesome. No, but, Let's do that pod Yeah, next. to answer you. 
<laughs> yeah, that's yeah. fine. You know, but it's like right now we have a lot of flashing mm. lights. And the question is, how do you make sense of those flashing lights? Because on the one hand, it looks like it's doing this. And how do you understand each flashing light in the context of their juxtaposition to the next flashing light? And the appearance of movement and how the frame rate in your brain actually connects those dots, but you can't really understand the flow of things unless you eat, understand each flashing light and their successive flashing on and off. This is yeah. way too deep was, for me no, on me, the end of the week. I, like, I Keith like loves it. this shit. No, so, I'm in. Yeah. Like yeah. the brain. Yeah, you're in. All right, is, Keith. Another podcast. Yeah, but it gets deluged with data, right? And so it takes shortcuts because it's trying to process it, which is. That's, that's right. It. That's Okay, Keith, yes. that's exactly yeah, it. Well, and so this was a United Country conference, man. Go. And nice. so it was tying in ranch sales and large land sales. We just sold the four sixes ranch oh. from Yellowstone, right, which was a cool. Congratulations. Nice. That's awesome. That's yeah. Awesome. That was about a year, year or so ago. But there's all these data points deal. and flashing. Mm. Yeah. And all these flashing lights. And, you know, everyone's talking about beep, beep, mm. beep, or, or beep, beep, beep. And you have to really... I think it's important that we as, as leaders in the, in this biz, business, you know, kind of, we have a luxury that our agents don't have every day and that our brokers don't have every day to kind of dig a little bit deeper yeah. and have a little bit more time. And that's what they're really wanting us to do for them is say, Hey, we're really good at what we do, but can you make sense of what the fed's doing and what, yeah. you know, the 10 years yeah. doing and sure. stuff. So, sure. Sure. but I don't know if I answered your question, but no, you know, I got into I real estate either, out, but of, it was out awesome. of curiosity. It was great. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I I really I got out of the tech space and, you know, I took a little bit of time off and I had five kids and I was um, I honestly wanted to take a pause kind of midlife, you know, early 30s. And I looked around. I like to hunt. I like to fish. and I like to be outdoors. And so I found an incredible cultural business with United Country that that that's what they mm -hmm. did. You know, they spent time on the land, you know, and so I uh, I looked around and I realized that boy, I, if I could go and help them or be part of that, I would also have an opportunity to be with them in rural Montana and in, yeah, that's you awesome. know, all over the United yeah. States. Yeah. yeah. And so, you've been doing that anyway. since uh, sort of. you joined United, United Country and then you have United Real Estate Holdings, which is the parent, I believe, for, for United Country. Is that correct? Yeah. So United Country Holdings didn't exist. It was just United Got Country, it. a business that was formed in 25. And I, um, uh, myself and some of my friends made an investment in United Country. And then since we've launched, I don't know, 25 additional businesses, including United Real Estate, the auction company, our technology company out of Austin. That's Florida. awesome. So, so I, I wanted to I wanted to bring you on because you and I have been talking for years and I've been following you guys and you're like 630 offices, 20, 21,000 plus agents, and you've done a lot of acquisitions. And I think this is really where we wanted to talk deeply about it because this has been, there's been a lot of acquisitions in real estate. We'd love to hear your take on it. Like what, what is it? How does, where do you, how do you look at a company that you're looking to acquire? Do you call them? Like, is it mutual? You know, you meet them at a conference. Like what is it? What does an acquisition look like for you guys? And then I want to dig deep into how that operates so that the, you know, brokers that are listening to this can start to understand what the business is and maybe how to set their company up long term. So, Tell us a little about some of the acquisitions. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so um, first, in order to be able to do acquisitions, you have to spend a lot of time getting the the foundation built. And so, well prior to uh, you know, as an acquire or or a merge or or a consolidator in a space, you have to make sure your team is prepared. Um, that they're skilled and experienced. You can't just all of a sudden wake up one day and say, "I want to start doing right. M and A." Um, you, you right. can't because you're, you're going to, you're going to, the pre-merger integration work alone is months and months of time to do due diligence, et cetera. But, but what we're looking for to be specific about your question, and we're always in conversations from various sources, whether it's conferences or honestly, just picking up the phone, I'll pick up, I'll look at data. I'll get online and say, okay, well, Charlotte, who's our fill in the blank yeah. city, you know, Nashville. Yeah. And you kind of look around and, and you reputationally, who's got the greatest reputation? Mm -hmm. It's not just based on size. It's based on who do we think from a distance might be fit. And then we start a conversation. We get to know them. We go to a lot of dinners before we ever make an offer because we want, to make, want it to be a good fit for them. 
and us, and we want it to be one plus one equals something much larger than two minus sure. that eight. So I got because uh, it's a yeah, lot I got of work. A question on that <laughs> fit piece, because yeah, uh, to tie yeah. it to earlier, I think fit sometimes can feel like your dinner table where it's a little art and a little science, right? And so yeah. the art piece is the feeling, right? How you feel when you spend time with someone and making mm-hmm. that that a languid, long like don't trust your first gut instinct, right? That's important, but do it over time. What's the science part of that fit? And I don't mean like size and unit count and that sort of stuff, but do you have quantifiable ways you're you're evaluating culture and leadership and, and that really fit good piece? Question. Hmm. Yeah, and it's it's as as is, as in everything, there's really not a defined line between art yeah, and science yeah, when it yeah, comes to yeah, this. Yeah. And it's it's also resting on I last time, and I think this is directionally correct. I've 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 been involved in about 350 transactions where it was a merger, acquisition, wow. divestiture, IPO, or otherwise in my career, going back into corporate finance, et cetera, and consulting. And you there, so from that experience, there's a bit of 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 the intuition actually is based on a a lot of yeah. data that's going to your, your like, institutional and the team in that space is just yeah. owned you can to smell a different it level yeah, you yeah. Can, is this yeah. gonna work yeah, yeah, you yeah. know is this is this person gonna behave badly mm-hmm. or the is the culture gonna fit but there is there is a way and we use it as a managerial tool as well and it's probably a whole nother conversation but we i modified uh i think it originally came from mckinsey an attribute mm-hmm. grid an attribute grid, which has a lot of soft mm. attributes. And then the team, as we get to know them based on those attributes, we score rank, you know, is it a cultural yeah. fit is, you know, what does the EBITDA mm. look like? You know, some of the, the more hard, precise the things, hard, but the hard science, the hard, yeah. but there's, there's also yeah. soft. And then we get multiple people who have, who come from a, with a different cognitive mm. frame or different life a different perspective to assess yeah yeah Yeah. like rick will come in amanda i'm just naming some people on our team that are critical to the process of integration and saying and ultimately you say are we going to have fun working with this person and can we get aligned around a vision and do some cool things if you get that wrong i know that sounds really soft i mean if you get that wrong that's a a huge problem right because if you're not aligned with the team that you're bringing in then you're going to have a lot of conflict it'll break break. yeah james and i talked yeah we talked about this a lot james we have the you know the saturday barbecue right Mm-hmm. If we wouldn't invite them to our homes for a Saturday barbecue, <clears throat> then why in the world would we invite them into our business lives? Totally true. Right? Yep. And yep. Yeah, that's right. And these are partners. Yeah. I mean, and a lot of them, they get so much money when you do a deal <laughs> that they don't <laughs> have to work. Like, yeah. And so right. you're, you know, you're kind of saying, hey, and and, and, it, and it's, and, you know, and actually, ironically, this is not intentional. I'm using my llama cup right now. And I don't know if you can no see drama. that. It says no yeah. drama. Yeah. No, no drama, drama, baby. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no drama, drama in my house. Yeah, yeah. we don't um, have a cup, but but we, now you also, guys, you also have to do the yes. math. Sure. I mean, you have to do the math. You have to make sure the returns are right. But that's like more of the mm-hmm. science side. But it's it's honestly not that difficult. And there are tens of thousands of people that came from investment bank that can right. do the math. The hard hard part Fit. is the pre merger integration diligence, the actual transaction itself, the day of, and then the post, and you know, we, we have, the goal is to help that business do even mm. better, you know? And so to, a, to us, to every, every single one of the ones that we've merged with their mm. people, their agents have benefited and we haven't lost anyone. We have not wow. lost a single person as a result of it. And the business that was already there is even flourishing more. You see agent count growth, you see those agents getting tools that they didn't have before. So it truly is a win for everyone involved. And if it's not going to be a win, if it's not a good cultural fit and the red line mm-hmm. one the of the attributes is, is it a fit for our culture and mm-hmm. values? Even if we score a five on all the other 10 attributes, there's 11 mm-hmm. attributes. If that one is below a five, then we do not mm-hmm. move forward. About five on a scale you of know, one and, to five. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be a five because if that is not a five, even if the financial metrics, right. the pricing and everything else is right. And even the geographic fit, you know, is it in our buy box? If all those other things are fives, it's actually a little bit frustrating, but it's the right yeah. call. We just say, and we never issue an LOI, a letter of intent, unless we are done with our due diligence, our preliminary due diligence of fit. And then we issue an LOI. 
so that our close rate is 100%. So I think that's a great segue to, you hear a lot of people talk about acquisition, and certainly there's been a lot of acquisitions in the space. Compass obviously being one that's done a lot of acquisitions over the years. Um, And you also see a Mm -hmm. lot of breakage. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at is if it's not the right fit, the break it, if somebody does, if somebody came over for a check only, but that's all they're interested in, then they're not, they're not out. right. Then yeah. the thing falls apart in a real hurry, which you've seen a lot of that occurring over the years. Um, and if an entrepreneur, James, doesn't truly, you, you don't see that true glimmer in their eyes that they love the people that work there and they love their agents they legitimately will tear up when they talk about the, the lore story of building their business and what their agents mean to them and, and their friends and family. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for that deep, passionate love to say, I really dig these people. They, they mean a lot to me. They are me. I am them. We are part of the blanket. So if somebody's, you know, not if somebody's to, looking to acquire, I should actually, I want to use the term you were using, uh, you were using a, a merger. Um, in that, which I thought was very interesting mm-hmm. in your terminology, because acquiring seems just you know you're taking over someone's business. Merging is two people coming together, which yeah. I found interesting with your yeah. terminology. If someone's looking to do that, you're you would all I'm assuming you're saying start with are they going to fit the culture of your of your company? And if they don't, don't do the deal because you're just going to cause a massive amount of breakage across the the spectrum of their. Yeah, and it's weird. It would be arrogant to say, do they fit our culture? It's mm-hmm. it's do our culture it's, it doesn't have fit. to be a per- yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a per, it doesn't have to be a perfect match because sometimes people will actually be accretive to our mm. culture. They'll bring something and not to pick on Philip, but Philip has an operational culture and a discipline and he, and and I could go down the the docket, right? And you know we Philip do. James, he that's why I brought him Philip, up. Yeah. Philip Cant- and, Cantrell and, by the way, benchmark realty out of, out of Tennessee. Yeah. You guys should check him out. He's amazing. So. Yeah, shout out. Awesome Great, dude. Yeah. He just stepped up into EVP of strategy. Awesome. Does the guy have to work? No, no he doesn't he have to work, to. but he's mm-hmm. excited. Yeah. We just left a meeting. You guys, we just left a meeting that we haven't announced yet. And we're, it's going to take us six months to pull out of the ground with a huge company to do something in real estate. That's never been done. And he's like, this is so <laughs> exciting. Like, by the you way, know, this is exciting. Retire. He doesn't need to yeah, yeah, stay in fine. it. So yeah. 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 But then you get Eric Pearson and you get Steve Wagner down in Atlanta and you get, you know, our, uh, oh my Lord, the guys down in Jacksonville, Ray and Sonny and Nancy, and you'll love them. And I'm, I'm, again, Sonny is a ball mm. of energy. And I'm like, our culture needs Sonny. He's like, let's <laughs> yeah, go. Yeah. You know, he sponsored the Jacksonville Jaguars. And I'm like, okay, well, that's a big investment yeah. to do that on a national <laughs> yeah. basis. But, <laughs> but I, I like the way he, I like his, I like his, Fun, but then he's just brilliant. And Ray is contemplative business operator and kind as can be. And I'm like, we're aspirationally wanting to be more like Ray and Sonny. And Eric is a younger entrepreneur, yeah. you know, in Washington, yeah. D.C. We're like, dude, you, I said dude yeah. for a reason because he, well, you've been on the West he's Coast the man. long now. Yeah. So. yeah. No, but he, we want more, we want to be more yeah. like Eric. Yeah. You know, honestly, just bring in a bit of Eric and let him, you know, season the, the, the so meal. So you're, you're saying basically they, they bring something into the mix and it helps change oh. everything. Talk to us about 100%. Talk to us about how the um how does how does he, how do you value the business? Let's talk actual like numbers. Like how do you come up with it? I know there's multiples okay. and you and I've been to many of these events before where people talk about how that works and that number changes. So give a little bit of insight on just, you know, if someone's thinking <coughs> about how they value their business, what should they be thinking about from a financial perspective? How do they, how do they go at that? And how do you look at it as the company that's potentially acquiring them? Yeah. So, so now we're getting into the technical sure. aspects of it. So again, back to the 300 plus yep. and Ernst yep. & Young yep. and okay. Investment banking. So there is a definitely an underwriting process, which is black and white, right? So you, you, we are a little bit different because we're looking at, we underwrite and project out based on the momentum of the business and what we know to be true. We don't break companies. We don't, you know, so we have a little bit of an advantage in our pricing because we don't have attrition and it, it shows up in a better, slightly better or significantly better price and structure because we can, our internal rates of return, I, you guys want me to get a, just, a bit get, technical I mean, just here? Get a, or, a technical okay. enough for people to understand, but not to the point where everybody's <laughs> Just send us your class. spreadsheet yeah. that we can give away to our listeners. That's what <laughs> yeah. we're really looking for. That's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. 
So, so the short version is you have to, you have to have a fulsome understanding of all of the historical performance, the trends, et cetera, and which ones are likely to continue, which ones were maybe what we call transitory, okay. you know, it was a one-time kind of pop market pop like or whatever. You get it's your, an, ar- it's an abnormal yeah. year. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So you, you basically get your arms around all of that and you project forward and you, you start to contemplate. Uh, in this line of business, we don't really build in a lot of what the, the industry calls synergies, you know, cost synergies, because there aren't a lot. You know, if they have some third party tech that we could potentially over time transition off of, great. But we don't build a lot of that yeah. in there. You know, there are some immediate advantages because we can procure certain things for them cheaper than they can procure sure. it for themselves. So there's some, some of that, scale. but You've minor scale. Yeah, yeah sure. What we're really after is understanding what's this trajectory of growth and market share in a particular market, and can we assist them in in accelerating that? And we have what we call a center cut view. We take a center cut view, which creates some conservatism in our calculations of IRR. And it's typically triggered off of free cash flow. The proxy for free cash flow is EBITDA. Um, as opposed to gr- company dollar and some other wacky multiple of NOI or something like that, we're looking at free cash flow um, a, as a as a multiple. And then there's typically people are uncreative about the uh, the multiple structure. You can have a giant gap in pricing expectation and bridge that gap with structure, and it's all about risk shifting from the seller to the buyer, the buyer to the seller. If someone wants an all cash deal up front, which we've done, the multiple is going to be a sure. lot lower because the risk higher. Yep. all yep. should. Yeah. And if they want, if they want um, a higher multiple, we're fine with that, but let's line up with a reasonable expectation of what, what additional dollars you're going to earn in at the end of year one, two, three, sure. four, whatever, the depending on how long they are on the asset. Yeah, but it's but most people screw up our outs, and mm-hmm. I've done it. I bought thirty five businesses in my last mm-hmm. business, and I was younger, and I didn't have as much scar <laughs> tissue as I have now. The worst thing that you can do is not pay an earn out for the buyer, right. because that means you have a seller, and now you're going to have cultural issues, DAS expectations. So we work very carefully to make sure that those earn outs are attainable, that they're aligned with them, and that they're, they're not so they're and they're aligned with the underwriting, right. the math. And so we, uh, and we even uh, in recently we've prepaid so earnouts. So not only did we pay it, but we paid right. it early because it, yeah. we wanted to, you know, which is, as a gesture sure. of goodwill and also just about managing our balance sheet. In the in the M and A world of residential real estate, they use the earnout as like a, a hook, right? Or even yeah. worse, to, it's to disingenuous sell the kind of dream of you could get this much, right? And that's misaligned mm-hmm. expectations, which turns into hurt feelings, right? And and then you've got yep. the, the drama llama comes out and, and it gets weird. So really intelligent approach yep. for people who are thinking about M&A to exactly what you said. L- let me make sure that this is a number, A, that you believe is achievable. B, if, if we're getting real saucy, we'll pay it early. And C, that... M- that both parties feel will make people happy, right? Will make them feel like it's working. Yeah, because happy is worth a ton of a money. Ton yeah. Of money. Yeah. Yeah. Engagement mm-hmm. is worth a ton of money. And everyone feels like they're like, this is right. awesome. Right. You know, you want to get to the point where, and it, and ultimately though, just make no mistake about it. I have very uh, good yeah. governance. Yeah. Sure. You know, I, uh, I've got, you know, Abri Partners out of Boston, Google them, and <laughs> McCarthy Capital. They're both yeah. awesome. You know, these guys are handpicked from a bunch of private equity groups. Uh, in our process mm-hmm. of selecting them, they, you know, they're selecting us, but we also sorted through a lot of other folks. Those guys are very right. good at holding mm-hmm. us accountable that our math is right, right you know, yeah. that our effort. But, yeah. So our underwriting is correct. Jump in. Is yeah. that right, James? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go. I feel go. like, Dan, you're at like, you know, if it was college, you're at 301 of M&A, right? Like you're, you're, you're up there. If someone's listening and they've thought about it, they want to do it. They think the timing is right to explore it. Maybe they own two offices in a city or in adjacent cities, but they've never done an M&A deal and they don't Mm -hmm. have the high powered governance and they don't have the decades of spreadsheets. How do they start? Like, I think I want to do MMA. Yeah, yeah. M&A. Great I question. I want to do MMA too, but I want to do MMA. Wrong pod, by <laughs> yeah. the way. That yeah. would be yeah. awesome, dude. What, what, how do I start? 
Yeah. So, okay. So I love that question, Keith. So we did a boot camp, an M&A boot camp, and it wasn't surf superficial yeah. and a bunch of unactionable mm -hmm. things. We brought all of our franchise partners in and our company operated location, principal brokers, owners. And we said, look, we're going to distill this down. And, you know, this is actually one of our biggest mm -hmm. value propositions to our offices. It's weird. It's off book. We are here we are an extension of our offices. So if an if a franchise office in fill in the sure. blank city wants to do a merger, they've been approached or they've approached somebody else, we will literally step in and work mm. for them. Not, not just sure, conceptually, sure. we will literally do burn the, the models. We will help them negotiate it. We will look for indications of mm. bad fit or risk factors, and we will structure the deal for them and not for mm. them, with mm. them, and coach them through the process. Absent having access to a deeply experienced M&A yeah. team. Honestly, for the good of the industry, if someone wanted to call me after they watched this and said, they're not yeah. even part of any yeah. of our companies, and they said, hey, can I burn your ear yeah. for an hour? I would 100%, I don't even care if they work with yeah. an Anywhere brand. Dan's, saying, Dan's or, inbox I'm not, to blow I'm just, <laughs> No, I'm... I no, am. I'm just telling you, I would 100% for the good of the industry because mergers are a positive thing when yeah, done right. correctly for... For people yeah. that matter, our industry mm -hmm. matters. You know, what we do matters. And if a broker wins, even if they're not part of us and they can, I would more than happy to put down what I'm doing and take a half hour, an hour and say, hey, look, here's some things yeah. you want to look at. Here's a tool you can use. I'd love to do yeah. it. It's fun. I actually love it. I love seeing other mm -hmm. people win, mm -hmm. you know, whether they're with us or not, you know, yeah. I dig it. That's awesome. I dig it. And it's, and there's also, you know, um, cause you and I go to the deal makers conference. Real trends is, um, does that, does a good job of helping kind of set up the basics of it. But if I, if I was to summarize your all cash upfront deals, that's, it's a big discount on multiple because you're taking all the risk. Usually I'm assuming it's some small, it's like 25% on average down and then some sort of earn out. Like what is the range at least in this day and age on the, the earn out? Is it, a, yeah, you don't have to give me specifics to your a company, credible, but just in general. Yeah, so, no, yeah. no, no, no. I'll give you. So right now people are not inclined for a number of reasons to do right. all cash deals. And I don't even think it's in the it. seller's yeah. best interest. Right, because yeah. they'll be okay. selling at, so, yeah, at a time, yeah. Yeah, and, and here's here's a great way to put it, and I hate, almost hate to get let this out of the box. Your company is not worth as much today as it was two years ago, and it's not worth as much today as right. it will be in two years. Right, right. So, so that means structure mm -hmm. has to come in. And I would say the seller needs to be committed in the form of a minimum of 25% down. Yeah. You know, minimum. Otherwise, the, the buy, I'm buyer. sorry, the, the, back up. Right, right. The buyer needs to be committed for at least 25% because that shows, A, they have the capacity right. to do it. They have the capacity to stroke the check because some people come into M&A deals and they actually don't have no, yeah. no balance sheet from which to consummate it. Um, I prefer to see, I, I, I think if I'm a seller, I would like to see at least 40 or 50% up, up front. And again, yeah, right yeah. now is not a great time to be selling so your business, but that's all our merge. where it settles out. Mm -hmm. 40, 50% yeah. minimum and, and a little bit more. Um, if you're nearing retirement, you're like, or the life mm -hmm. is happening sure. to the seller a little bit more, possibly you're approaching 50, 50, you know, 60%. And the balance of it is, is either if you're longer on the asset and the seller is really just looking to take out a partner, you would, you would, and the other person, the other founder, let's say there was a shared ownership is wanting to stay in and is very long on the business. We're like, yeah, right on. Let's rock and roll. You, uh, you know, have a longer tail on, have a longer tail on the second and third payment. I, getting into real tricky. I'm just trying to give people yeah. an you know, five idea payments. of what it, what it is. But let me yeah. ask you this. Is there, Yes, because I've heard this before and I, and, and I know people all do it differently, but there's some type of value placed on, I'm going to call it the agents per se in production. And if people walk or it creates breakage, the, the earn out comes down. Is that correct? So if there is, if there, and I know in your case, you guys have been really successful at this, but if there was breakage, then the amount of money you're paying decreases. Is that a correct statement? See, we're a bit more okay. flexible because how they get to a certain amount of EBITDA and profitability Sometimes we put guardrails as far as because agents equal market share equal transaction volume, right? We, we put guardrails sometimes, but they're reasonable guardrails. That means it wasn't like a fault. We had never had it happen and it won't happen if you right, do great due right. diligence, sure. cultural due diligence. 
But sometimes we put downstroke guardrails just in like a scenario that's highly unlikely to happen, but we have downstroke guardrails. Mostly, uh, James, I'm, I'm really focused on how you get to the EBITDA at a measurement period is really, we want to keep that entrepreneurial spirit. So if you change the mix of agents, you recruit a couple big teams that are highly productive, that's, and you lost, let's say, let's say you had 300 agents or 100 agents and you lost 25 of them, but they were unproductive agents and you kind of mm-hmm. shifted strategically to more productive people and you're actually doing more, tra- you yeah, hate sure. to penalize yeah. someone because they did the right Whereas thing, you know, so. So Sometimes we tend to not a structure them where yeah. it's just an earnout on the agents that were there at the time of the deal. Right. Right. It, you can, do, by the way, in smaller mergers where they, it, it, you, you can do that, but even then you want to make certain that they have, you factor in the normal attrition yes. of life happening. So, you know, people don't do that. Right. It's not right. fair. Yeah. You know, so you, you're merging them in. You say, look, you know, the agents yeah. are going to move. They're going to retire. But in, they're going to do whatever. And it's about 10% point, a year. You can also incentivize growth. Why turn that off, right? Like why have the person who yeah. has for decades normally been a mover and a shaker in a city and, mm-hmm. and well-known? And when the merger happens, the phone always rings. Like, tell me why, right? That's an opportunity to grow uh, if if it's done right. Mm-hmm. So, so incentivize it should be. The growth as much as the as their earn out on, on the legacy agents. That's very smart. So let me ask you this, cause we got a, yeah. we got a few more questions before we wrap up the show today. The first one is what should, uh, for, for the audience, they, they own a real estate brokerage. What should they be doing to think about how they can sell their business long-term or what should they be doing to structure their business to make it more appealing to a buyer? Like if you've got a person that's, I'm making this up, they got a 50 agent office and they've, they've set this up, this independent company and they're, they're doing well and they may want to exit in 10 years. What should they be thinking about now and, and getting things in place so that when they come to someone like you, they say, I'd love to sell my business to you. You're going to look at it and go, if, if you did these five things, it's going to be more appealing to us. You know what I mean? Like, how do we give them some advice now to think yeah. long term for their exit? Yeah. You know, you want to see well-organized, well-run companies. That's kind of somewhat of a one-on-one. You know, we know what our results are pretty quickly at the end of each month. We have back-end systems from an accounting perspective. Uh, you want to have very spirited and kind and nice operations people that are close to the agents. You need to be close to the agents and you need to operate as if you're not selling or you're not going to merge. You, like you're operating as I'm, I've got my, even if you know because of retirement, life happening, or you've got this scheduled or hypothetical date that you're going to exit, you manage your business as if you're going to continue to manage it indefinitely. Because somebody else right. is going to want that momentum. They're going to want that. Yeah. So that's that's like a, a it, managing to an end point and thinking about you. I can smell and experienced people can smell from a million miles away when people are dressing up right. a business to sell it. They start mm-hmm. dropping the cost. They start <laughs> trying to do some things that are yeah. actually going to see a little bit of a dip. You know, you want to make sure that they're managing. And if anything, they're mm-hmm. building momentum as they're reaching the window that they would otherwise like to have right. a liquidity event. Um, the other thing is, 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 is be flexible, like mentally be flexible. If you, if you're, if you're trying to retire and go to Maui, so okay, far, on, so in far, 2027, like I'm with you so I'm far. So you. good. All right. In mm-hmm. 2027. Okay. You want to really, you, the, the, the buyer is going to want you to be there post transaction, right, right, transaction right. date. So you, you're really, your transaction date is going to be rolled back. Yeah. At least a year to give this to give the the buyer ample opportunity. To say that's fine if you want to go to Maui, but we need to work the together transition. during an yeah. extended period of yeah. time. Yeah. So you got to yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Otherwise, yeah. it's going to yeah. break. And it's yeah. it's, it's going to break. Make any sense? Yeah. So those are probably the two biggest things. And just be organized. And you know what? Honestly, just here's the one thing that people do. And I, I normally say it right up front with people: if there's there's always yeah. some ugly bits, right? Always, mm-hmm. just get them out early. Because if I'm here talking to you, it means I'm super interested. You're also going to find good all person, of them in, in yeah. due diligence yeah. anyway. So yeah. like, let's just uh, yes. be, yeah. yeah. It's going to come out. Yeah. And it, and by the way, you can always navigate you, those you know things. Now, if right. it's, yeah, when you know about them, you're like, and sometimes people think things yeah. are big things, but they're actually not. 
you know, they're like, hey, it's okay. That's normal in business right. to have you that happen or this happen. Now, there's companies. some things that are you've, third you've, rail. You're expecting mm-hmm. there yeah. to be some skeletons in the closet. And if they tell you up front, it actually is. It's actually yeah. weird then when they like, really worry, right? Like <laughs> yeah. now you've hidden yeah. it so well, I can't even yeah. find it. So that's bad. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, Dan, this yeah. has been really, uh, yeah. really awesome. I have one last question and it is the most important question that we are going to do on this show. And Let's you have go. no idea what I'm going to ask. So okay. It's that you're going to, you'll enjoy this. Remember, remember. It, this, no, yeah. no, this is a really no good one because it goes to culture. <laughs> what is the secret to a really okay. good crawfish boil? Because Ooh. I've heard about these things. Yes. Like, oh, I've baby. I've heard about these famous crawfish boils that you do. And I'm ashamed to admit like, I've never had a crawfish I've, in my I, life. And I haven't done it either. Oh, so tell baby. us what's the secret, man. Give us the, give us the lowdown because I know you do these often. So. Yeah, yeah. It's it's making certain that you manage your ice cubes yeah. and your <laughs> bourbon as you're cooking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that I swear because of your, yeah. your, your nostrils uh, and your, your senses the, get you know the palate to to smell in a different way. That's brilliant. That is, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'm looking forward yeah. to By the way, I do that. I take, <laughs> I take that same approach when I boil hot dogs. So I get exactly what you're saying. <laughs> I get exactly what you're saying. <laughs> Oh, that's great. I love it, Dan. Uh, Well, Dan, look, uh, we really appreciate you being on the show today. Uh, Really insightful stuff. Uh, We're going to put your uh, some of your information in the description. Um, If people want to reach out to you, they can do that. Obviously, just be patient, everyone. Dan's a busy guy, um, but he is also extraordinarily generous with his time. So um, it was awesome. Thank you so much for being here. We hope you enjoyed it as well. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Hit that subscribe button. Trust us. It's the best thing any of us will accomplish today.